Hello everybody, it is such a pleasure to be with you today. My name is Kim Green and welcome to another episode of Fueling Equity. At Southern Company Gas, we've been working for the last year and a half or so to work on fueling equity through conversations that are hard, engaging, and sometimes uncomfortable. And we are working to listen, learn, and lead as we fuel conversations. And certainly the king of uncomfortable conversations is Emmanuel Acho. Welcome, Emmanuel. Kim, thank you so much for having me. I've, I've rarely been told I was the king of anything, so I will, <laughs> I will gladly take the kind words, my friend. Well, you are terrific um, in terms of your history, your background. I'm sure many folks know you played professional football in the NFL. You are a celebrity sportscaster now. You also have two Emmys next to you that I <laughs> want to talk about. I love that. Certainly, we all know about your videos, an uncomfortable conversation with a black man. You know, I love that. 31 years old, you have done so much already in your relatively short lifetime. Tell us a little bit about your background, and I know you're from Texas. Tell us about your childhood a little bit. Yeah, so everything will come full circle as I start with my childhood. I am the youngest of four, and I'm first generation American. My parents were born and raised in Nigeria. That matters for several reasons. First and foremost, I grew up in Nigerian culture, eating Nigerian food, watching Nigerian TV shows, going to Nigerian small group functions. Um, but then I grew up in Dallas, Texas. I went to a predominantly white, affluent private school called St. Mark School of Texas, Kim. It was an all boys school. We wore uniform. Um, and so I wore white button downs and gray slacks from grades five to grades 12. Very limited distractions. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> but all of that to say, Kim, is like, I grew up Nigerian cultured, but also immersed in uh, amongst affluent white spaces. But I went to church really in the hood on Wednesdays and Sundays. And so I was just kind of a blank canvas growing up in Dallas as the youngest of four. That ends up mattering a lot more, and I will continue to tell you why during the course of this conversation. But it was during my upbringing that I realized, wait, there's a difference between color and culture. And I don't think a lot of people have acknowledged that in our society is you can be a certain color but not understand that certain culture depending upon how you grew up. I was black by skin color, always have been, but I grew up Nigerian culture. And so I fully understand Nigerian culture, but I also understood the white spaces and white culture, if you will, because I grew up in those spaces as well. But then as I was traversing through my teenage years, young adult years, that is when I had all the fullness of cultures painted on my blank canvas. And as a result, I would say I've been able to speak in this moment and also hopefully add value in this conversation. Hey, that is so interesting. I'd love to dive into that a little bit more, this idea of um, this blank canvas and all of these different cultures and experiences adding to that. Talk about how you, as you expanded those experiences through your teenage years and, and maybe even into college, what did you begin to learn about either the differences or the, the similarities and how did you begin to start appreciating diversity and recognizing that we probably needed to be talking about things more. Yeah, well, Kim, growing up, I often heard, Emmanuel, you're like an Oreo, black on the outside, white on the inside. And I had to wrestle with that because I was like, what, what's that even mean? And I didn't realize how offensive that was at the time. I was 11, 12 years old. But as I matured, I realized, wait, these white students were saying that because I spoke in an educated manner. Um, and to be educated was to be white. So they would say, Emmanuel, you're black, but you, you don't really talk like you're black. Emmanuel, you're black, but you don't really dress like you're black because I guess to be black was to, I don't know, maybe sag your pants or, or wear a do-rag or a wave cap or whatever the case may be. Things I didn't do because I didn't necessarily grow up in that culture. I grew up in Nigerian culture where we do several different things based upon dress, speech, etc. I realized, Kim, that, oh, there's a major disconnect in our society. I'll put it like this in layman's terms. 
If you study a foreign language growing up, and Kim, I took Spanish. Do you recall, what, what did you take during your, 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 your study, student years? Hola, hola, espanol. <laughs> exactly right. Um, <laughs> but Kim, unfortunately, that's about all I know. That's, about, that's where it starts and stops. <laughs> I get it. You, yo, yo también. <laughs> Um, I know a little bit more. I won't show off, though. Um, yes, no. yes, yes, I bet you do. <laughs> so, so look, Kim, I remember vividly my Spanish teacher would say, Emmanuel, if you want to be fluent in a foreign language, you have to immerse yourself in the culture. See, so many people might have a Spanish-speaking friend, might love Spanish food. They might celebrate Cinco de Mayo, but they can't speak Spanish because they weren't immersed in the culture in the same manner if you want to be fluent in the understanding of our cultural differences, both black, both white, whatever the case may be, you have to immerse yourself in the culture. I was immersed in black culture, immersed in white culture, all while being Nigerian. And I understood, Kim, that, oh, there is a huge language barrier. Just like the person who travels to a foreign country but has not immersed themselves in that culture, there is a language barrier. So thus you have black people saying, hey, we're oppressed, there's systemic racism, systemic injustice, and our white brothers and sisters don't understand. You have white brothers and sisters saying, well, what, what do you mean by systemic injustice? What do you mean by racism? And you have black people saying, how do you not understand? Because there is a language barrier because of the lack of immersion culturally. So it was really my young adult years, primarily my first few years in college, when I fully understood how offensive some of the things I lived through truly were. So how have you um, guided your white friends who have said, I want to try to understand black culture better without necessarily being able to be immersed in it? How can we learn and and what what advice do you have for us it's a great question um i think the first thing i would say is don't put a limitation an unnecessary limitation on one's life you can immerse yourself in any culture you know what's so funny kim and, and this is what i try to do over the course of these conversations is break things out in layman's terms we over every summer, so many people, so many families will travel to a foreign country and they'll go study abroad in college or they'll go to Spain for two weeks with their family, may go to Europe, may go to Cabo, Cancun, Puerto Vallarta, whatever the case may be, and will willingly get on a plane, spend money, maybe even download a Duolingo app and immerse themselves in a culture that's foreign to them in a completely different territory. Yet, in America, we act as if it would be so foreign to go immerse ourselves in, in other cultures for free. When we do this on spring break, on 4th of July's, on Memorial Day weekends, we do all of these things. So the first thing I would say is, let's not make something impossible that is very easily attainable, right? Which is immersing oneself in a culture. The second thing I would say is, and, and my practice is, I try to use three things, three words, truth, grace, love. No one cares what you know until they know that you care. Fervently believe that. It does not matter how much I know if you do not know that I care about you. Kim, that's why I always say my white brother and sister, because brother and sister has a term of endearment. So it is implicit in my sentence that I care about you. I could say black folk, I could say white people, but there's a term of endearment associated with brother and sister. I also believe if you only speak with truth, Kim, it's too jarring, with, it'll just cut. If I walk out the house and my clothes are mismatched and, and my friend, my sibling might say, ah, you look terrible. Well, sure, it might've been truthful, but you could've been nicer about it. <laughs> um, in the same manner, Kim, it's if you only speak with grace, it's like superfluous, meaningless nothings. So I believe we have to have three primary components, truth, grace, and love. But if I can stop down for a second, this is the uncomfortable part. Because I believe so many of my white brothers and sisters do say, okay, Emmanuel, well, what can I do if I can't immerse myself in the culture? Why can't you immerse yourself in predominantly black spaces? Kim, uncomfortable conversations with a black man, and for those that aren't aware, it was a video series I started 
um, which now has 80 million views and led to the New York Times bestsellers that Kim was referencing. Oprah Winfrey calls me after she sees it. McConaughey calls me. But the point is, it started because I was having a conversation, true story, with a white friend of mine. After the murder of George Floyd, I went to my white friend's house, Kim, and I was angry, righteously angry is the best, kindest way to say it. And I sat down with him, his wife, and another white couple, and I said, we have to do something about our problem in society. We have to. I was, I was borderline furious. I didn't know how to control my emotions. I was just so upset. And they said, well, Emmanuel, what do you think we can do? I said, I said, white people have to immerse themselves in black spaces so that they don't view all black people as a threat. Proximity breeds care, distance breeds fear. And, and they said, okay, well, Emmanuel, how can we do that? And I said, um, I don't know, black small groups, they, they, they're uh, uh, religious, people of religious faith. So I said, you can go to black church. We go to church, we used to go to church together, this couple and myself, this white couple and myself. They said this, Kim, and this is when I knew uncomfortable conversations had to start. They said, we thought black church was your thing. And I said, no, black church isn't like my thing. First off, black church started because black people weren't allowed into the white church, but that's not my thing. I said this, Kim, I said, what do y'all mean? I, I go with y'all to white church all the time. This was their response. It's not white church, it's just church. To which I said, to y'all it's just church. But when I walk into this auditorium of 2,500 people and I'm one of four black people there, it's white church. See, we live in a society that is just something, but to black people, it's black something. That's why there are black owned restaurants, because to be a restaurant is to be a white owned restaurant. That's why there are HBCUs, because to be a college is to be a predominantly white institution. So it's just coming to the realization first and foremost that we can integrate our society. I, I'll say this, and this is what I said when uh, me and President Obama, former President Obama, we had a talk back one time. And the question on the floor was, how can you solve racism? That was a question on the floor. And my answer, similar to his, was this. The biggest problem in our, 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 one of the biggest errors our country ever made, in my mind, Kim, was outlawing segregation. Oh, everybody gets quiet. What do you mean, outlawing segregation? To which I respond, rather than outlawing segregation, we should have mandated integration. And there's a huge difference. See, outlawing segregation is like taking words out and putting them in parentheses. A word in parentheses in a book, you don't say it out loud, but you still read it. So it still exists. You just no longer vocalize it. Similarly speaking, when we outlawed segregation, sure, we took down the whites only signs and the no colors allowed signs, but we still read them in our head and in our heart. Whereas if we would have mandated integration, then now it would have forced us to have a better understanding of one another. So now the trick is, are we mandating integration in our own lives? I know I've said a lot, but that's the key in my mind is mandating integration in the workforce, mandating in your family life, mandating in your social circles, mandating in your religious gatherings, mandating integration. Anyway, go ahead. Wow. There is so much that I'd like to follow up on with that, and that was so powerful. Let me just hearken back to that dinner you had with your friends, and you were so angry. I will tell you that I have the privilege of working with a, a lot of African Americans, a lot of black people in my company, and they were angry too. I was also angry. We were angry together. We all knew something had to change. And we also began, and I'm very thankful to so many people for helping guide the need for us in our company to have conversations. What I will say, Emmanuel, I thought I was immersing, that's probably strong, but I, I felt that I knew a lot of black people really well, socially, um, again, through work, and we spend a lot of time together, but what I heard from a lot of my black colleagues that really ripped me to the core is that they felt, and in and, and many aspects of their life, there's a bit of a mask. There's a bit of a, you know me, but you don't really know me. And um, I think that I have learned so much and what I often hearken to is Maya Angelou's quote, 
do the best you can until you know better. And when you know better, do better. Do better. Yeah. And that's exactly what we are trying to do with these conversations. Thank you for being so open and honest. That's what you are. That's who you are. That's how we move this conversation forward. And I've heard you say that that people need to feel the pain. And I believe we're beginning to feel the pain. Um, talking about that immersion, it's Black History Month. And how can we celebrate Black History Month to the best of our ability in your mind? Man, that's, that's a phenomenal question. Oh, I love that question. Let me tell you why I love that question. Remember, I went to a predominantly white school growing up from grades five through 12. Um, prior to that, I went to a predominantly black school, and then obviously at Texas, I was on a football team, black spaces. But when I was in my uh, private school, Kim, Black History Month, the first day of Black History Month, they would serve watermelon, cornbread, and fried chicken. True story. I, I never understood <laughs> how like ignorant that was until I got older, right? Like, you know, all the white kids at the school, oh my God, it's fried chicken, da da da. And even the young black kids at the school, we would too kind of lean into it. We're young, we don't know any better. You know, we see the stereotypes, etc. I think we can celebrate something without exploiting that thing. I've, the first time I've ever answered this question, this is why I, I love it. I've, I've talked a lot about these conversations for 18 months now, and I, I've never answered this question before. But I think we can celebrate something without exploiting it and without kind of being facetious with our celebration of one thing. I think the best way to honor acknowledge, and acknowledge Black History Month is to actually learn about black history, right? Study some of the great orators, like black orators like Frederick Douglass, uh, maybe commit to uh, amplifying uh, uh, black voices throughout history or black voices present day. Like history is also occurring right now as we speak. So the amplification of black greatness, I think is um, something that would be very noble during Black History Month, but also not just making the celebration of black accomplishments a month, but rather celebrating black and esteeming black accomplishments on a continual basis. Now, so many people, Kim would be like, okay, Emmanuel, but like for what? I think we have to recognize the reason that there is a first black vice president woman, who's a woman is because for so long these things were impossible, either literally or figuratively speaking, right? Like there have been barriers throughout the course of history, not far history, um, that have disenfranchised black people, I'll personalize it. I went to the University of Texas for undergrad and for grad school, and I believe it was former President Painter, University of Texas President Painter, who in the 1950s didn't want a black student admitted to law school for the only reason was, quote, because he was a Negro, close quote. So this isn't as though we are so far removed from these different barriers that have been holding down and discriminating a group of people. So there are large scale accomplishments when we see history being made. And I think that's the best way to celebrate it. Again, I caution and give pause to my white brothers and sisters, every month is White History Month. So if so many people will be like, well, where's White History Month? We celebrate white history every month because we have always esteemed the accomplishments of our white brothers and sisters, but we have not always esteemed the accomplishments of black people and we have made it nearly impossible, historically speaking, for black people to accomplish. And that's just, that also needs to be on the table. Outstanding. You've had these amazing conversations on the videos. I think that I've been impacted by each of them. Is there a memorable moment in one of those videos that was particularly impactful for you? And if not, maybe just kind of overall the summary of what you hope that your viewers are taking from this series. Absolutely, there was a memorable moment. I sat down with two white parents who had a biological white son, a biracial adopted son, and uh, they adopted two black children from Haiti. And the youngest girl was a sweet girl. She was 12 years old at the time. Her name was Story, just this beautiful black girl. 
And I looked at Story and I asked Story a question that would answer a question so many parents who have adopted children of different races might have. I looked at Story, Kim, and I said, Story, do you wish your mom or your mom raising you was black or looked like you? Because I know, Kim, that so many white parents that adopt black children, they wonder if they're enough, right? They don't fully understand black skin. They don't understand black hair. They don't understand black culture in its entirety. And I know they just wonder, am I enough? And I asked Story, this 12-year-old girl, this question, and, and Kim, I did so because either way, the rea- response was gonna be emotional. Either she was gonna say yes, and ugh, mom was gonna cry, or she was gonna say, no, I don't wish she looked like me, and mom was gonna cry. So I asked her, and you could hear a pin drop. And Story responded, no, Emmanuel, I just want someone to love me for me. And in that moment, race was ripped apart, barriers were ripped apart, tension was ripped apart, and Story, this 12-year-old black girl, didn't care that her mother didn't look like her, didn't care that her mother didn't grow up like her. She just said, love me despite, and love me in spite, and love me through all of these differences. Learn about my differences so that you can love me better. Learn the fullness of who I am so that you can serve me better, but you don't need to look like me to love me. That is so beautiful. Thank you. All right, now you have so many cool things going on and I know you've just published a new book. Tell us quickly about your new book. So, um, a logical saying yes to a life without limits. So true story, I started writing a logical before I started uncomfortable conversations with a black man. A logical I started writing in April of 2020. Uncomfortable conversations didn't occur until May. I'll preface with this quote that I hope inspires some people. Sometimes in life, You may be headed towards a destination, but your detour can be greater than your destination. So uncomfortable conversations with a black man was my detour. Um, A logical is my true destination. I want people, Kim, to be the best version of themselves and live the best version of their lives. I feel our greatest accomplishments in life come on the other side of our logic. I got my master's degree in sports psychology and over the course of my own life and the study of other greats, I don't believe in setting goals. I believe in having having an objective with no limitations. Because if you set a goal, at best you accomplish your goal, but what if you could have accomplished more? Or at worst, you don't accomplish your goal and you ruin your self-esteem and self-efficacy. So a logical is all about helping people maximize the best version of themselves and change their world so that they can change the world. I love it. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. Wow, what a privilege to have the opportunity to spend some time with you. You are just terrific. Thank you for helping do what we've been focusing on at Southern Company Gas, and that is being comfortable with uncomfortable conversations. This is the way that we listen, learn, and lead, and it is our goal to lead and fuel equity in our company and our community. So thank you so much for everything you've done, the example that you're setting, the great work you're doing, and that you're going to continue to do. So again, everybody, thank you for joining us, and I look forward to seeing you next time on Fueling Equity.